Hello and welcome back, everyone. Um, I want to make sure my audio is on. Today's the last of the series of Jefferson's slides that we went through uh, fall and winter quarters. This is the last Jefferson lecture. It'll be seven weeks before spring quarter begins, and I will be doing James Madison. His entire presidency will last only spring quarter for six sessions. We'll be meeting again on Wednesdays, beginning March 27th and uh, ending on May 1st. Then we have a uh, long recess over the summer months. <clears throat> I'm assuming the library is still going to be available for registration. They have told me that they, or they have not told me anything. So I assume you'll be able to register at the library and through OLLI, the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute for this spring quarter class. Thanks. Uh, today, uh, we're gonna begin with Jefferson's post-presidency, which, which started on March uh, 4th of 1809 and ended with his death on July 4th of 1826, died on the 50th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence and died within hours of John Adams also. Uh, we are gonna talk about his personal finances, which were uh, ghastly. Uh, government can't have a debt, according to Jefferson. He thought it was horrible if they did. He thought it'd give way too much power to the federal government to be able to have debts. And yet Jefferson had a lifelong debt, uh, paid it off two or three times immediately back into a uh, huge personal debt again. Spent a great deal of money on buildings at the Monticello Plantation. Here's a picture of them today. This is Monticello where Jefferson lived, the mansion. This is slave quarters. I hope it looked that good when slaves were living there. He had 600 slaves, so there were many buildings that looked like this. Quite a great looking deck up there on that uh, top of that first floor. I expect this was a stairway and looks like it has a fireplace in it. Uh, might've been a caretaker or something. Uh, in 1815, uh, Jefferson sold all his books to the Library of Congress, which had been created by Congress. And he sold all of his books in order to pay off the debts that he had run up. Uh, in 1814, during the War of 1812, in the bottom photo here, uh, the Library of Congress was burned deliberately uh, by the British. Uh, fortunately, it was a year after that burning that Jefferson sold these books to the Library of Congress. Uh, here are enlarged pictures of the uh, library uh, burning. And this is actually after the burn. You can see lots of scorching above the windows. Uh, so Jefferson's books, anyway, he survived the fire. He had 6,437 books and uh, sold them to the Library of Congress for $23,950. That was about $3.72 per book. In 2020, by inflation, he would have received $479,000. That's, uh, that's over $74 per book. Uh, under the, it, This is in a circular rotunda area of the Library of Congress. Jefferson loved these circular things. And here you can see uh, a modern day present view of 
a portion of Jefferson's library. Here's another section. So they had a couple of double walkways there with Jefferson books in them. And as you enter, you can read about Jefferson and this entire uh, library here and, uh, and walk through there uh, in the Library of Congress. In 1826, uh, 12 years after he paid off the debt and the year of his death, he was again $100,000 in debt. That's about two to two and a half million dollars in 2022 money. He proposed to his friends that there be a lottery that would uh, pay off his debt. <clears throat> they were legal in his day. You would sell portions of it and then draw numbers and people could win some money. But of course, the person running the lottery would get a great deal of that money. So Jefferson said, uh, okay, I'm going to do a lottery. Uh, however, his friends started looking around, talking to each other, and they gathered up enough money to pay off his debt so the lottery never occurred. Uh, Jefferson, the writing of Jefferson's titled Notes on the State of Virginia. Uh, this is the only book Jefferson ever wrote. He did a tremendous amount of writing, but it's in the form of letters and, uh, you know, short uh, articles and so on. <clears throat> so notes on the state of Virginia, it's still in publication. You can buy it on Amazon or order it through uh, bookstores, et cetera. Uh, what's he talk about in this book? Well, one thing he talks about is the natural resources and the tremendous abundance of natural resources, forests and farmland and rivers and fresh water, et cetera. Europeans read this book at the time it was published and they wouldn't believe it. No place could be like that. So he'd always thought, uh, 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 Europeans had always thought the colonies were just a devoid place. So uh, he saw a second thing is uh, the economy, and he really celebrates farming and the amount of farming that can be done, the amount of great farmland, large amount of minerals, such as they're pictured in the lower left here, uh, that can be used for a variety of things. Uh, but in particular, uh, the presence of limestone, which could be used for building and the large amount of forests, which could also then be used for building. Slavery talks about several things. Uh, Africans and Americans can never live in harmony. Blacks just have no understanding of freedom. They would never survive well in a democracy or be decent citizens. Uh, thirdly, he opposed miscegenation in this book. That's the marriage between blacks and whites. Uh, now, the uh, uh, lots of states had limits on marriage between black and whites up until the 1967 Supreme Court decision. Here's a Virginia couple, Mildred and Richard Loving, and they were married in Virginia and they uh, sued to have their marriage uh, legal, and it went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court approved intermarriage in the Lovings versus Virginia case. It was a unanimous decision, nine to zero. Uh, here's pictures of this couple with their children, and you can see the daughter certainly could pass as white. Uh, slavery. Uh, nature made blacks slaves. This is a natural occurrence. Uh, th these guys uh, were real big on natural law back in the late 1700s, early 1800s. And, and they said freedom was a natural law. It's not a man-made thing. And 
but blacks just have no understanding of it. Uh, this is an attempt here by Jefferson to justify white supremacy. Uh, here is uh, an example of the maintenance of white supremacy, uh, certainly up through the 1960s. People frequently ask me, when did slavery end? I always tell them, 1967, passage of the Civil Rights Act. And, you know, you talk to a lot of people, they say not even then, but Lyndon Johnson deserves a tremendous amount of credit for undoing Jim Crow laws and bringing, uh, getting blacks uh, accepted into colleges and unions and so forth. Slaves should be uh, exported back to Africa, according to Jefferson. The United States is just no place for freed slaves. Uh, they just can't adapt to this kind of uh, living. So all the slaves that have been freed, they're just mucking around and not knowing what to do. There was been some commentary about these attitudes of Jefferson. So these uh, next couple of things are not from Jefferson. Uh, he, had, he was full of a tremendous amount of hypocrisy. Uh, in the 1770s, the Jefferson and his colleagues fought for freedom from uh, England. Uh, they didn't want to be uh, colonies. Uh, they won that battle, but they maintained slavery for uh, Africans. Uh, from 1780 to 1810, freed slaves in the state of Virginia, where Jefferson lived, rose from 1,800 freed to 30,000 freed. So in that uh, in that 30 year period, there were Lots of people dying who owned slaves and uh, freed some of them, mostly because they were family members. Uh, but the uh, number of freed slaves, even though it increased from 1,800 to 30,000, was still in the single digits by percentage, you know, so it was still just maybe 5% of a state. Native Americans, Jefferson comments in his books, notes on the state of Virginia, they are very capable people. Uh, they can live with Europeans. They will adapt well to an agricultural life. Many already were leading agricultural lives. Uh, those that were nomadic would have no trouble getting settled. Uh, history, politics, religion, and culture are discussed in the book. Jefferson talks about separation of church and state being absolutely necessary, talks about France having state-supported Catholicism, uh, same thing with many European countries, uh, some many of them Protestant, and having state-supported religious groups, and that that cannot be allowed to happen in the United States. Here's what Jefferson said. Uh, the legitimate powers of government extend to such acts only as are injurious to others, but it does me no injury for my neighbor to say there are 20 gods or no gods. Freedom of religion, real big for Jefferson. Uh, he uh, Talking about politics, he says, uh, Countries should have constitutional government. You write down what the rules are, and that's a constitution, and it should include uh, liberty for all people, lesser Africans, of course, or unless they're women. Uh, Jefferson stated, individual freedoms are necessary, must be protected against religion. Here's a political cartoon about religion. Here you've got a, a angel or relig highly religious person giving divine guidance to the legislatures of the states and the United States. And uh, they're head holding the hand of the legislature who's writing about what religion should be like in a country. And over here, Who's he think messing, he's messing with? Some school board 
couple of flies on the wall. Maybe some of you have seen the ad by Ronald Reagan Jr. He says, hi, I'm Ronald Reagan Jr. I'm an atheist. And he does this ad on TV for the Freedom From Religion Foundation. A geography of the United States talks about the multiple numbers of uh, rivers and uh, mountain ranges and seaports that are available. Talks about the environment uh, stretching from heavy winters to year-round summers. And, uh, he did not allow his name on the book. He was worried about retribution or feedback, and, uh, and uh, he just uh, was very concerned about that. So... The book just came out as Notes on the State of Virginia. Uh, Jefferson's beliefs here. Uh, now we're going to talk about 11 political attitudes that he had. All men have rights. Notice the word men is in there. Uh, women and slaves are not included in Jefferson's argument about rights. Here's a young man from recent history holding up a sign. All men can treat women as equals. A jury system is required, according to Jefferson. Everybody deserves a fair trial by a jury of their peers. Of course, if you're a woman brought to trial, no women can be on the jury. Uh, uh, these jury trials guarantee rights from the Constitution, preserves the Constitution. So what's, uh, what happens eventually? The first woman on a jury in the United States was in Minnesota in 1921. When women got the right to vote in 1920, uh, Minnesota passed a law that they could also serve on juries. And the uh, first woman on a jury was in this state, Minnesota, for those of you that are online here and are living in Minnesota. The first black on a jury, amazingly, was 1817, and uh, super amazingly, it was in the state of Mississippi. Man's name was Andrew Barland, and he was a freed slave. Uh, individuals and a majority may not limit the rights of others. This would probably be better stated by may not limit the rights of individuals. So, and, uh, you know, people cannot say, well, you, you can't do that. You can't do this. Uh, everyone has rights. These are individual rights. Uh, majority does not count the number of people I have had conversations with that think the essence of democracy is majority rule are dead wrong. The essence of democracy is rights for individuals. Uh, so you can't limit the rights of others. Well, corporations uh, do this regularly. They prohibited free association uh, unions from the end of the Civil War up until the depression of the 1930s States would call out militia, their militias, the governor of the state would to put down unions. Uh, these uh, uh, corporations would say, uh, you, know, you know, you can't form any unions here. Anyone who attempts to do it was fired. Uh, they practiced discrimination against minorities and women, uh, mostly in the form of low wages and um, in many cases, uh, not hiring at all. Uh, you know, such signs as we all remember from history classes, no Irish need apply. So it could include minority groups, uh, uh, not just based on race, but based on nationality too. And mining of limited resources, uh, one company only. You know, states and the federal government would both say, okay, you can have this chunk of territory. You're the only person that can mine in that area. Lots of other things that uh, corporations have done. They're really top-down organizations. They got somebody at the top, set some rules, 
You measure the people below you by how they enforce those rules. It's the exact opposite of a democracy. The worst record of any corporation uh, is uh, belongs to Coca-Cola. Uh, the best record for uh, honoring individual rights is Unilever Corporation. Walt Disney in the 1950s was paid $400 a month by the FBI in order to report communists that were working for him. Well, what did that mean? That meant anybody that tried to form a labor union was a communist, and that's who Disney would report to them as, here, these people are attempting to, afford, to perform uh, or form a union. Uh, my father was making a couple thousand dollars a year in the 1950s. Walt Disney was being paid $4,800 a year to turn in union organizers. Uh, and the United States military has its own justice system. Anyone that commits a crime or, or does not obey the rules of the military can be tried within the military, and it's a very different uh, form. There have been uh, groups there in the lower right that uh, have, um, uh, you know, taken looks at uh, people all during the 20th century. Uh, the Nye Committee after World War I, people that were opposed to the war. The House Un-American Activities Committee under uh, Nixon and Joseph McCarthy and what has come to be called the McCarthy era. And there's current contenders uh, in this uh, battle against uh, people that they disagree with. Uh, voting uh, limited. Uh, Jefferson said, uh, unreasonable people should not be allowed to vote. That's pretty open-ended. Um, uh, I mean, any particular group of people on, on the political spectrum think there are other people who are unreasonable. Anyone who's dependent on someone else. You got an 80-year-old father living with you who can't work anymore. He's dependent on you for food and housing, and, uh, well, he can't vote. And women and slaves were excluded in Jefferson's conversations about voting rights. Uh, this whole voting rights section is uh, kind of lengthy, so let's get used to it. Approved. Yeoman farmers were approved. What's a yeoman farmer? That's a person over 21, so there were age limits on voting. We've now reduced that to 18. Main argument against it when it was reduced to 18 is you can draft people into the military when they're 18, but they can't vote till they're 21. But a yeoman farmer is someone over 21 who can vote and who owns land. So you had to own land. It was under Andrew Jackson that the ownership of land was uh, removed from uh, a qualification for the right to vote. Not approved were tenant farmers. There's a museum in a little town in, uh, I think it's in Virginia, the Southern Tenant Farmers Museum. A tenant farmer is somebody who rents from a person who owns land. So you got yeoman farmers, they own their land. Tenant farmers, they're renters. Uh, day laborers, these are people who work in cities and uh, they should not be allowed to vote. Uh, they've got jobs like cleaning the streets such as uh, pictured here. Uh, vagrants, homeless people, if you don't have an address, you're, uh, you should be limited to uh, from voting or uh, you should be prevented from uh, voting. Uh, this happened in uh, North Dakota and recently in the 2010s, North Dakota said, uh, in order to vote, you have to have a street address. Okay, well, homeless people don't have them. Well, neither do reservations. This was an attempt by the North Dakota legislature to stop the voting of Native Americans. 
Reservations have no street addresses. They have post office boxes. You go to the post office, pick up your mail. End of story. Well, immediately then, the reservations started putting up signs. This is 13th Avenue and put this address on your building and so on. Uh, women were not approved for voting. Even women of wealth uh, were not allowed to vote. Uh, some states only allowed landed gentry to vote. Uh, these are people that own gigantic portions of land, rented it out to, in some cases, hundreds of people or scores of people. So people who own lots of land, and and I mean, they had to own plantation size settings before they could vote. Uh, a farmer who owned land and did not rent it out would not be allowed to vote, according to some. So landed gentry, there they are, people of wealth, uh, in the early 1800s, uh, there were the beginning of arguments from people that land should be made available free of charge, a gift uh, to poor people or to non-land owners. And the United States actually started doing this. And uh, uh, we had uh, uh, people coming here from uh, many European countries uh, simply to gain uh, land uh, free of charge. That land ran out in 1892, and it's considered a major point in U.S. history where free land was no longer available. Uh, so anyway, street addresses in North Dakota, less voting machines are ways, ways to limit voting nowadays. You put um, less voting machines in black neighborhoods, less places to vote. Uh, bus lines, uh, in some cases, they've you know you have to get on a bus to get to the voting place in a black neighborhood. So you limit the bus lines in black neighborhoods also, or you say no bus traffic on election days and make it more difficult for those who you're opposed to, to vote. Uh, do you pay a tax? These are political attitudes of Jefferson. If you don't pay a tax, why should you be allowed to vote? There was no income tax until 1913. It was opposed by the Constitution, and a constitutional amendment was passed that allowed it. You could not have a direct tax on people, according to the Constitution. Uh, businesses paid taxes, uh, so people that uh, own businesses could vote. Uh, this was an argument that really supported the rich, because uh, that's where taxation occurred. You're bringing goods into the United States, you have to pay an import tax. Uh, or you're, uh, you have to pay a property tax if you're a business. So uh, lots of business people could vote, for instance. And, or Jefferson supported that. This is the last of these slides, uh, number five, on voting rights. Jefferson supported this tax argument. Uh, and of course, it was great for him and his rich pals to be able to uh, prove that they were paying taxes on something such as the land that they own. Jefferson thought the military and militia people should all be allowed to vote whether they own land or not. So support, strong support for the military. Individual rights. Jefferson wanted equality. He wanted governments kept at bay. He saw governments as a place where individual rights could be suppressed most easily. So no strong federal government. Uh, by institutions, uh, 
uh, he's arguing uh, uh, rights can be are denied by institutions. They are not denied by human nature. Uh, so uh, the natural argument, uh, nature wants people to be free. Other people maybe don't. And that was a major argument used by founding fathers. Democracy can work. People can rule themselves. Kings are not needed. These were arguments made by Jefferson. Uh, you know, the, the, whole, uh, the whole argument of democracy is people can rule themselves. They don't need an upper class to do it. They don't need a king to do it for them. So Jefferson is arguing uh, that in the book, uh, or in the, I'm sorry, in uh, his uh, 11 major political arguments that democracy can indeed work. You don't need a king. He said no to a strong federal government uh, during his uh, retirement years. And he uh, encouraged uh, uh, patronage uh, between wealthy people. Oh, we can give you this, we can give you that. He said, uh, rights belong to the states. Uh, so states, big, super strong states rights advocate, very much an anti-federal government advocate. And it's okay for rich people among themselves to patronize each other. Uh, democracy should support a single culture. Everybody should be the same, exactly like me. White folks that own property. Uh, Self-determination. What do you want to do with yourself, your life, your marriage, your whatever? Uh, democracy should support that. Uh, your right to rise up in the uh, economic structure, for instance. And he supported uh, education for all males. When he founded the University of Virginia, uh, one of the rules was anyone can attend free of charge, and here's your living quarters also free of charge. Made no difference what your economic class was. And finally, number 11, essential to democracy was public education and a free press. And uh, by free press, pretty much through the 20th century, uh, uh, the first two thirds of the 20th century uh, meant you didn't take positions. Uh, prior to that, newspapers had uh, Names, you know, like the Cincinnati Republican or the Des Moines Democrat or uh, my uh, my wife is from St. James, Minnesota. Their newspaper is the uh, St. James Plain Dealer. You know, they're not taking sides. And, and uh, then it became uh, just report facts. Then under Ronald Reagan, he said, let's get rid of that, just report the fact stuff. And we now have uh, very heavily uh, biased, and I don't mean that negatively, very heavily biased uh, TV stations in particular, all day news stations. And, uh, but most newspapers still limit their um, commentary to an editorial page and have a separate group of people who are on that editorial team. So uh, central to democracy, according to Jefferson, public education. At one time, 14% of all education in the United States was private. It dropped to 7%. It's back up to about 11%. Uh, Jefferson would have been opposed to this. Uh, Jefferson's death, cause of death. Uh, if you're not uh, uh, fully uh, 
interested or have difficulty talking about diseases, this is a good time to uh, go check the refrigerator. Anyway, uh, Jefferson had dysentery, a bowel disease is what that is. It's like diarrhea. Some say, no, that isn't the disease he had, but dysentery is bacterial and it's spread through water and food. And here's the name of the disease down there. Uh, I'm going to talk about headaches and bowel diseases. Again, you know, you can turn the sound off, leave the room, uh, come back in three minutes or so. Uh, Jefferson had uh, migraine headaches uh, throughout his life. These are migraine headaches. Here's a definition of them. They last four to 72 hours. They're unilateral, I mean, like one side of the head. They're, they have a pulsating uh, symptom, uh, moderate sometimes, very severe often, aggravated by physical activity, uh, sometimes nausea, vomiting even, sensitivity to light or sound uh, can bring them on. Symptoms of dysentery. Uh, bloody uh, diarrhea is uh, what dysentery is. Uh, you often get a fever with it, abdominal cramps. You feel dehydrated. There's a lack of fluids in your body. So thirst, dry mouth, cracked lips, uh, less frequent urination as a result. Skin starts drying up, headaches, rabbit heartbeats, cure for dysentery. Uh, you need to get rehydrated, you're short on water. This was nearly impossible in the 1800s when Jefferson had this illness. You can't drink water, not enough, not fast enough. Uh, so, and plus water's a common spread of this disease. Uh, you know, today you're, you're given injections of water. Uh, antibiotics are a cure. They kill bacteria, but there weren't any antibiotics until the late 1930s. Bacteria is not known as a cause of diseases in Jefferson's day. Um, so, you know, there are Two possibilities for what causes diseases. They thought stuff that smelled bad meant uh, you could get a disease from it. So people living around uh, bodies of water that had very negative smells, or it's God punishing you. Uh, eventually, uh, by the end of the century, we start making associations between bacteria and human diseases. Uh, property distribution by Jefferson. He had a lot of land around Monticello. 552 acres were bought uh, for $7,000. In 2020, that's about $150,000. So when he died, this is sold off by his daughters, and uh, they keep the plantation. Uh, uh, this uh, uh, 20, 21 acre in Virginia costs about $4,700 today. Uh, that would bring you $2.6 million, whereas uh, Jefferson got 7000 for 552 acres today, you'd get 2.6 million by inflate by uh, the actual cost of acreages in Virginia today. Uh, his will and testament. This is his one of his daughters, Martha Jefferson Randolph. Uh, in in his will, Jefferson said that he wanted Monticello to become an orphanage for children. Instead, his daughter, Martha Randolph, pictured here, sold the property. And over the next 160 years, it's owned by uh, several wealthy uh, um, 
uh, people, uh, mostly a single family for more than half of that time, of almost 100 years, a single family owned the property. Here are the people that owned it. Uh, James Turner Barclay, he play, paid $7,000 for the building, plus the very limited acreage around it. And then he sold it to Uriah P. Levy. Uh, then a man named Benjamin Franklin Frickland took it over when it was confiscated by the Confederacy because uh, Levy family, Levy family were... Uh, nor were they supported anti-slavery. Okay, after the war is over, it goes back to the Levy family. Then uh, after uh, Uriah Levy dies, Jefferson Monroe Levy uh, buys it uh, from that uh, fellow uh, for $10,500, that's 1879. Levy family owned it. I think it was actually something like 98 years, but it was roughly 100 years. This is uh, Uriah Levy, who purchased it in 1834. Uh, they sold it in 1923. They'd owned it for 92 years. They maintained it exceptionally well. And it was purchased by the Thomas Jefferson Foundation for $500,000 in order for it to be made into a museum. And here was is the man who was the last owner, Jefferson Monroe Levy. Uh, this is a picture of one of the main rooms at Monticello and you can, you can see lots of stuff was nicely preserved, the furniture, uh, wall hangings, uh, paintings, et cetera was very well maintained sculptures and so on. Uh, Jefferson's epitaph, uh, he wrote his own. He said, here was buried Thomas Jefferson, author of the Declaration of American Independence, the Statute of Virginia for Religious Freedom, and the father of the University of Virginia. And here's his tombstone uh, with that uh, inscription on it. Uh, Jefferson's estate in his will. Uh, massive debt, $100,000 in 1826. That's about $3 million uh, in 2020. That very year, he managed to get it paid off because his friends donated money to him. Uh, but this... Uh, in essence, this left nothing for his heirs. Heirs. Uh, all the slaves were sold within a year of his death, and uh, he owned, his maximum was about 600 at the time of his death. It was less than that. Here's another picture of an area uh, of Monticello with uh, animal skins hanging here, here's a, a map of Africa. Here's a map of uh, the Eastern United States. Here are fossils. He was very interested in fossils. And, uh, children that he had with Sally Hemings were freed. Uh, there were a total of six children. There are not uh, pictures of all of them, that, uh, photographs that we have, but Beverly Hemings here was a son of Jefferson and his slave, Sally Hemings. And this is three of the sons of Beverly Hemings. Uh, there are no known images of Sally Hemings, although we have paintings and drawings of her that people proposed what she looked like. Uh, her children are, uh, are there's no known uh, paintings of them, but we have this photograph. This is a grandson of Thomas Jefferson who passed for white. Jefferson's accomplishments. 
Uh, three major items in the accomplishments of Jefferson uh, that uh, historians have declared to be his greatest uh, legacy. He wrote the Declaration of Independence. Uh, tons of correspondence. Uh, there are 18,000 letters, roughly. He, if he started at the age of five writing letters, that would have given him 77 years of letter writing. That's 233.7 letters per year, four and a half letters per week. And he probably didn't start writing letters until he was a bit older than that. But uh, you can see this guy was very busy uh, writing uh, uh, letters in particular. Uh, it's how people communicated. Here's a letter of Thomas Jefferson's. He starts off with, Dear Sir, so we don't know who it's to. Uh, Monticello tells where he's at and what the dates are, but not the year. I am very thankful to the Bunker Hill Monument Association for the honor they have done me in electing me an honorary member of that institution. And here's his signature. These letters are very expensive when they come on the open market. I've been a presidential autograph collector. I have paychecks these guys have written and so on. But when I started collecting in the early 1980s, Jefferson material was very expensive. I do have just a signature that was cut from a letter. Um, so anyway, this is a 1825 uh, letter. Thanks for mentioning me. That's what the 25 means. Frequently, he did not include a year annual date. Uh, and a third and last, he was a Renaissance man, interested in a wide variety of things, very broad interests. He had lots of knowledge. He learned about stuff. He contacted people who had the same interests, and he had uh, lots of talents. I have a broad range of interests, so I'll always be working on something. Evaluation of Jefferson. Uh, from 1826 into the 1860s, so from his death, 1820s to the 1860s. Everything was very positive. He was a founding father. He'd been a president of the United States. He was an intellectual, uh, and we just heard wonderful things about Jefferson. After the Civil War, he begins to decline a bit. This is the 1860s to the 1930s. <laughs> He'd been a states' rights advocate. Federal government is finally beginning to gain some power because they were able to rid us of slavery and, and uh, uh, Jefferson's support for slavery during this period was a negative. And his anti-federal government, as the federal government was growing, correcting things, building a huge economy within the United States, the U.S. Industrial Revolution really occurred in this time period, 1860s to the 1930s. So, so we enter decline. Uh, Civil War declined. Uh, the South lost it. Southern and Western states still support states' rights. There, states' rights is still active super active in the dark blue states and very active in the light blue states. Also here, just in the dark blue only, not these light blue states are not states' rights, but a lot of these Western states are also still very much uh, states' rights uh, advocates. Uh, Jefferson's opponent was Alexander Hamilton, pictured here, wanted a strong federal government wanted a federally run national bank. Um, Hamilton rose in stature during this period, 1860s to the 1930s, uh, became a big federal supporter. Uh, today, Hamilton has just been 
uh, blown to a huge figure due to uh, the Broadway play uh, celebrating his life. Uh, from the 1860s to the 1930s, Woodrow Wilson was president in the 19-teens. He, Woodrow Wilson stated, though a great man, not a great American. Uh, Woodrow Wilson was a PhD in uh, political science. And, uh, so this is a statement coming not just from a president, but from a highly educated person in the field also. Uh, so you can see uh, the changes that are taking place. 1930s to the 1960s, this is the Great Depression. And uh, through the uh, 50s, World War II era, et cetera, uh, Franklin Roosevelt quoted from him quite a bit, held him as a very positive image uh, for Jefferson. Positive image, uh, positive things from presidents were done during the 1950s. Uh, the 1960s to the present, we had the Civil Rights Movement and the women's rights movement. Uh, Jefferson declined sharply again. He was a slave owner. He fathered children with a slave woman. Women had no say. He talked about the rights of men. Major memorials for Jefferson. This is the Jefferson Memorial located in Washington, DC. It's domed. You can see it has a very large statue here of Jefferson on the interior. Uh, this statue is 19 feet tall. Uh, I've made many trips to Washington, D.C., and uh, only once did I visit the Jefferson Memorial. Uh, and it's a very interesting, pleasant spot. Uh, lots of things on the walls uh, written by Jefferson, very lengthy quotes that you can read. Same is true at the Lincoln Memorial. Uh, I mean, his entire inaugural address is, uh, is on the wall. Lincoln's is. People just sit on the floor in there in front of these things and uh, are awestruck. And it's very quiet in most of these memorials, uh, including the Jefferson memorial. Sometimes people are talking, you get groups that come through. Uh, here's the Lincoln Memorial over here. Here's the White House here. Here's the Washington Monument. So you got the Lincoln Memorial, this gigantic long pool here, and the Washington Monument. Now, this is the Jefferson Memorial. So you can see it's in a tidal basin. This is this is the Potomac River, and water has run back into this lowland area called a tidal basin. And you can uh, you can see the Jefferson Memorial is built right there. Notice this section here. Now, in that section right there is where uh, the Franklin Roosevelt Memorial is now located. This picture that I chose doesn't show it. And the Martin Luther King Memorial is in that area also. So there's a lot more to see down in that area, well worth the walk on the paths. And, uh, located in the Tidal Basin is also a George Mason Memorial. Everybody goes, who the heck is that? This is a guy that uh, absolutely insisted that there be a Bill of Rights. And he said they ought to be in the Constitution so they can't be changed. But uh, they were never placed in the Constitution. Uh, Mason arguing for a constitutional basis for a Bill of Rights was told, we'll add them as amendments after it's approved. And that's what happened. There were 12 proposed amendments and the first 10 were included they are known as the Bill of Rights. This is the man that argued most strongly for a Bill of Rights in the U.S. Constitution or and then accepted them as amendments. 
Here's a book on George Mason, Founding Father Who Gave Us the Bill of Rights. Again, available through any bookstore if you're willing to wait for it to be ordered, or you can have it in a couple days on Amazon. And it's just George Mason is the title. Another memorial for Jefferson is near Rapid City, South, South Dakota. Actually, uh, this isn't a memorial built by a government organization. Uh, there was a guy, a businessman in uh, uh, South Dakota who said, uh, we need some tourism here. Uh, we need people coming through here. And he saw to it that this got built. And uh, I mean, it took quite a while. These images are 60 feet high. The uh, upper bodies were never finished. It was taking so long. Look here. You can see the upper body lapels on Jefferson. Uh, you can see there's uh, workings to for arms and on uh, uh, Washington, I mean. And uh, that was going to happen with Lincoln and these other two also. So the uh, Jefferson, uh, Lincoln, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, and George Washington Memorial in Rapid City, South Dakota has never been finished. But Jefferson is one of the figures carved into that stone. Uh, Jefferson's image uh, for... Uh, many years, uh, has, since 1938, has appeared on the five-cent nickel coin with Monticello on the backside of the coin. It replaced the buffalo nickel. I'm sure you all remember this buffalo nickel from your uh, childhood. They were still in circulation for many years after the Jefferson nickel came out. So here's uh, close-ups, little larger images of the Jefferson Nickel, a memorial to Jefferson, and uh, the uh, nickel with the uh, Native American profile and a buffalo on the reverse. Uh, the $2 bill has a picture of Thomas Jefferson on it. These are not widely circulated, never really have been. Soldiers were paid in $2 bills. And then the military would go to banks and say, how many $2 bills did you get deposited? And uh, where did they come from? And then they knew where soldiers were spending their money. Now, this... This has been hypothesized and never been stated. Uh, some banks have come forward and said, yes, that's true. But the government has never said, or the military has never said, yeah, that's what we were up to with, with the $2 bill as payment for the military. Uh, some corporations uh, did this with employees also. You'd have a town where you had a single very large corporation like a meatpacking industry, and it's in a town of 10,000 people, and almost everybody in the town works there. And uh, it wasn't necessarily that they were paid with $2 bills, but the cash they were paid with may have been marked somehow, uh, such as this sort of marking that was placed on money. And then the corporation where most of these people were working would go to the local bank, want to know where, where did these deposits come from? And, you know, if it was a big enough business, they'd start one. Uh, we'll put the grocery store out of business. Everybody has to buy from a grocery store that's owned by uh, the corporation where they work. Uh, Jefferson is on the $100 United States Savings Bond. Here's a picture of it, Series Double E Savings Bond. Here's the name of the person to purchase this one in uh, Clarkville, Tennessee. Um, and here is Jefferson. 
uh, stamps, uh, dozens of uh, postage stamps of, uh, well, make a, uh, hundreds of thousands of postage stamps have been sold with Jefferson images on them. Here are three, one cent, two cent, five cent, 10 cent, 26 cents. Today, a postage stamp is 66 cents now. <clears throat> Here's another one from 2012, and uh, it's a got a picture of the Jefferson Memorial, and this whole area around the Jefferson Memorial and other areas in Washington D.C. have cherry trees planted. This is a cherry tree in blossom, and the tourism during the cherry blossom season in Washington D.C. is sky high. Japan gave these uh, cherry, some of these cherry trees to the United States during the William Howard Taft administration, and his wife liked them so much, she saw that more were planted, and even more have been planted in the more than 100 years since then. Washington, D.C. is famous for these walkways full of cherry trees. A minor memorial. This is a plant named for Jefferson. He was a botanist. He had friends who were botanists. This is the Jefferson Dephelia plant. <clears throat> William Bartram was a friend of Jefferson's, a fellow botanist. He named this for Jefferson and in honor of Jefferson. It's a twin leaf stalk that rises up and has two leaves on it. And then another stalk that is the bloom, and that stalk is leafless. And you see that during uh, April and May in bloom. And uh, this is William uh, Bartram, friend of Jefferson's, fellow botanist, who discovered the plant, named it for Jefferson. Here is the range of the uh, twin leaf or Jefferson Dophelia, and you can see it is throughout Minnesota. For those of you that are uh, listening to this lecture from Minnesota, <clears throat> uh, in November of 2023, a plan was announced whereby a bird species and plant species that were named for races would. Uh, no longer be named for them. If you were a slave owner, they wouldn't be named for you either, uh, et cetera, any, any negative connotation like that. This is also being done for plants, this renaming. Uh, Lake Bidet Makoska used to be Lake Calhoun, named for John C. Calhoun, uh, who uh, was a slave owner and a politician and uh, uh, very much uh, protective of slavery. So it was renamed recently, given the original Indian name of Bidet Makoska. So the Jefferson Dophelia plant will be renamed. Uh, controversy post-presidency. Uh, New York City Council Chamber has a had a uh, statue of Jefferson in it, and there were protests about it. And in November of 2021, uh, so just a little more than two years ago, it was removed, and slavery was the issue. This is a slave owner. You got a statue of him in the uh, City Council Hall of New York. Here it is. This is the City Council Hall, and here is the statue of Jefferson that has now been removed. Uh, many in the black community are arguing that uh, leave these uh, slavery associated statues alone. What we'd like you to do is put up next to them a pro uh, civil rights, a pro-Africa, a pro-African ancestry statue or memorial of some kind. He's, and the, their concern is we might forget about uh, 
people might generally forget about the way that blacks were treated and about slavery and about the civil rights movement if we remove all these negative uh, items. So add pro-civil rights statues near the uh, statues of people who have a negative history about slavery or civil rights. <clears throat> Rankings for Jefferson. Uh, the Siena College does a ranking. They do it irregularly uh, about every four to eight years. It was started by Arthur Schlesinger Sr., who was a historian in the uh, and taught at Harvard, and his son, who was an advisor to John F. Kennedy and also a, a Harvard professor. And when they both died, it was turned over to Siena College to continue it. Uh, in 1982, Jefferson was ranked the second greatest president. He is now, and over the last uh, 30 years, been ranked in fifth place. Uh, you know, it was always Lincoln, Washington, Jefferson or Lincoln, Jefferson, Washington. I like that. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt has moved up to number one. So it's now Franklin Roosevelt and then Lincoln, etc. You can look this up. Uh, just type in Siena College and they'll show the they'll show you these rankings and you can look at the most recent ones. Uh, his masterly pen, and this is, uh, let's take a look at uh, this book by Fred Kaplan. This is uh, Fred Kaplan. It's a very negative biography of uh, Jefferson. <clears throat> uh, and here it is, and again, it's readily available. He, he uh, argues in his book, uh, ref, well, the Jefferson was racially biased. There's no question about that. Uh, he was negative about women's abilities. His reaction to criticism, he, he uh, just brushed it off all the time. He never answered criticism, just spoke it away, turned his back on it, uh, never justified uh, his positions or changed his positions as a result of criticism. Uh, he uh, thought an agricultural lifestyle was the best thing possible and an absolute necessity for democracy. Uh, Kaplan contends this is a false belief. Farmers lived minimal lives. Uh, they could barely grow enough food for their own families in most cases. And third, urban life is immoral. Uh, another false belief. Uh, according to Kaplan, and there's research that uh, shows this. Rural areas in the United States today, the premarital pregnancy rates are significantly higher. Smoking rates are higher. Uh, low seat belt use. Uh, social isolation, which frequently affects mental health. And the vaccine denial in recent years has been much higher in rural areas. So the whole notion, uh, uh, the perception of rural people is that this is so great and it's much better than the horribly crime-ridden uh, urban areas just simply is not uh, true based on the statistics. Uh, Jefferson hated the British, sided with the French. However, uh, the French Revolution, okay, great, Jefferson liked that but it became a dictatorship. Napoleon became a monarch. His children, uh, are, as it moved on, I mean, we had Napoleon II, Napoleon III, et cetera. Uh, the kingship was simply restored. Jefferson hated the British, sided with the French. The King of England will enslave the colonies, according to Jefferson, yet Jefferson owned 600 slaves according to Kaplan and everybody else. Jefferson wanted a weak federal government, but uh, the fact was uh, 
it wasn't the federal government that he was concerned about. It was keeping it weak so it couldn't destroy slavery. And um, that's not totally the end. I've got a few more minutes. So uh, I have removed some slide groupings, a couple of slide groupings, because I knew I wouldn't have time for them. But let's take a look at them for the next few minutes. Uh, I had a section on historiography. What is it? And uh, look at four different, these are schools of interpretation. I took a class on historiography and you just go through, you know, the last 500 years and what people were writing. You got hierarchical history, romantic history, economic history, ideas history and revisionist history. These are known as the flaming five. Hierarchical. This is tension between classes of people is what causes historical events. Uh, Karl Marx is the major uh, purve purveyor of this uh, hierarchical historical interpretation. And he has he had a list of classes of people, most famous, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. Uh, romantic history, uh, that's, uh, that's also known as the great man theory of history. Uh, today, we call it the great person theory. You can see there's one woman in here, Mother Teresa. But when it first came out in the early 1800s, this romantic period of history was called uh, the great man theory. What makes historical events occur? Individual people <clears throat> who uh, lead the way. And that's what romantic historians talk about. Romantic historians, what do they write? They write biographies. Here's a picture of lots of individuals, and there's one woman in there, Marie Curie. Eurocentric, male-dominated field. Economic historians. Uh, economics is what makes historical events happen. Rising and falling of different things, inflationary, this and that, financial concerns. Uh, Marx fits in here also. Uh, so do lots of the schools of economics around the United States, the Hoover Institute in uh, San Francisco and the University of Chicago Economic School, both very conservative, have put out lots of uh, uh, books by <clears throat> economic historians. Ideas. Great thinkers are what moves history. People who are writers. Uh, perception, reality are things that they talk about. What do you, what do you think you see? And what's the reality of what you see is what's often talked about in these books. And revisionist historians. Now, a lot of people go, oh, that just means that uh, that's false stuff. No, it doesn't. This is a field of historical interpretation. Uh, look back at previous interpretations, uh, revisionist historians do. The books that they talk about um, or that they write uh, they talk about the changing ideas. I always uh, told my students, I said, always think of what the opposite is when you hear an idea of some sort or an opinion of some sort. What's the opposite of that? That's what a lot of revisionist historians are doing. Uh, revisionist historians dealing with the role of females, they talk about them as advisors to their husbands. Uh, if there was no male error, they would be allowed to become rulers. Uh, now, uh, rightful participants and still growing. And uh, then, I, I generally, I don't talk about uh, modern popular books, but John Meacham's uh, book, The Art of Power, about Thomas Jefferson is very interesting. Uh, here is a, a picture of the book and a picture of John Meacham 
it's available all over the country. And uh, so anyway, here's what I've already said. I, uh, we're going to look at seven major items from Meacham's book on Jefferson. Um, Jefferson was a philosopher and a politician. Meacham says this is very unusual to have somebody who's an intellectual and a politician <clears throat> uh, in the same role. Jefferson was non-confrontational, according to Meacham. Uh, Kaplan also stated that. Uh, this endeared him to a lot of people uh, because uh, uh, he was just a nice guy. Um, now, Meacham also argues this may have been a result of uh, Jefferson's stutter, which was very bad. Uh, so it was difficult for him to speak. Uh, it may have been a uh, not something that uh, he chose to do, this non-confrontational nature. May have been a, a due to uh, this uh, speech pattern difficulty that he had. Did lots of social events, dinners, et cetera. Uh, Meacham's super supportive of Jefferson uh, throughout the book. Uh, many others think he's overrated politically. Uh, Jefferson's a giant supporter of rights and liberties, according to Meacham, civil rights, civil liberties, giant supporter of education. This is the University of Virginia with a library at the center, not a church. Here's the mall area. He was the founder of the University of Virginia. Uh, Jefferson, <clears throat> uh, Meacham points out, Jefferson had lots of supporters among the presidents, uh, in particular, Lincoln, Roosevelt, Truman, Kennedy, Reagan, frequently quoting from Jefferson. Uh, but um, Jefferson also wielded a lot of power despite his uh, anti-federal government stance. He per uh, The Louisiana Purchase, which added a great deal of land and yet talking about less government. And that is uh, the end of uh, Jefferson. Uh, the next, uh, next thing we're going to do is go to uh, questions, if there are any. And are you there, Paul? Thank you. Um, yes, uh, JB. Oh, my, there are several questions. We do have several questions, um, and we can go right into them since we have about 12 minutes left. Uh, the first question is, are people able to look at the books in the Library of Congress, and can they check them out? Uh you you can look at them and do research. I don't I don't think you can check them out. Also, um, I go there with my university card when I was doing research for the university, <clears throat> and uh, there were areas I was not allowed in into. No, you can only do the general collection. Uh, other areas they would say I can only let you in here. If you tell me the name of a book you want to see. Now, here's our book catalog. You know, you can look through that, pick a book. I'll get it for you. Then you can sit here and you can walk around and look. So sometimes it's very limited. In Washington, D.C., very near the Library of Congress, is a library on Shakespeare. I walked over there, said I'd like to look around. They said, do you have a Ph.D. in English literature? I said, no. And they said, you, can, you can't use this library. And uh, they have a replica there that I was allowed to go into, a replica of Shakespeare's uh, Playhouse. Uh, it's two-thirds the actual size. That was interesting. But um, talk about limited. I mean, you have to have a PhD in English literature in order to use that particular library. So I'm done. All right. Uh, next question is, didn't most people at the time during Jefferson pay a variety of excise taxes? And did, they not, did that not qualify them to vote? Uh, I don't know how that excise tax thing 
uh, work and who I, I don't think it was very many people that had to pay that. In the modern age, uh, you know, Lyndon Johnson put an excise tax on uh, underarm deodorant and shaving cream and stuff like that to help pay for the Vietnam War. And frequently those excise taxes were things that would be initiated for a period of time and then stopped. Uh, and people weren't buying stuff in Jefferson's day. I mean, you pretty much were self-sufficient, uh, both in terms of food gathering and even making your own clothing. You might have to buy... Uh, <clears throat> you know, cloth in order to make clothes, but that was part of the role of women in Jefferson's day. So I don't know that very many people were paying excise taxes, no. Uh, the next question is regarding Washington, D.C., um, and I guess would like to know your opinions on renaming Washington, D.C., or if you think it'll ever achieve statehood. Oh, no. Uh, there, there hasn't been a lot of controversy about that. The major concern is the D.C. part. Now, Washington was a slave owner. D.C. is District of Columbia. That means it's named after Christopher Columbus. I mean, committed genocide against uh, uh, Native Americans, uh, you know, throughout the Caribbean area and the northern part of uh South America and so on. So uh, there are certainly issues about the name of Washington, D.C., both because of Washington slave ownership and of the association with Christopher Columbus. All right. Um, the next one is regarding the ranking of presidents. What's the criteria that's used for ranking those presidents? Uh there are about 800 historians that uh, Siena College sends out uh, research to. And if you go into that website, you can see they have 20 different classifications, you know, stuff like domestic affairs, foreign affairs, spending. Uh, there's, there's 20 of those, and the historians rank them. Uh, so it's a, it's a well-done piece of research and you can see how each president is ranked based on foreign policy for instance um uh, yeah uh, and a tale um the jefferson epitaph did not mention his present presidency why do you think that was uh because he wanted to be remembered for these other things in particular, the founding of the University of Virginia, he thought that was the greatest thing he'd ever done, was promoting education for people of all classes, as long as they were men. <clears throat> but uh, uh, that was his choice, and uh, he, he did not see politics as something that was a high-order profession. All right. Uh, we'll take some time for one more question, then I'd like for you to give a little plug for the James Madison series coming up. Um, okay. So do most presidents have a presidential library? Uh, no. Uh, presidential libraries were uh, formed by Congress in the mid-1950s, <clears throat> and they stated that you, you can have a presidential library run by the federal government only if you're still alive as president. So Herbert Hoover was still alive. There's a Hoover library down on Highway 80 in Iowa. And, uh, uh, and then every president since Eisenhower ha has one. Richard Nixon didn't want the federal government doing anything with his. So he said the, the hell with it, uh, and he kept his private. When he died, the people running it said, okay, we're turning it over to the federal government. Uh, Reagan was concerned about that also. Uh, we'll see what Donald Trump is going to do. Uh, uh, so, But at any rate, no, that's pretty much a modern thing. It's a 70-year-old law. 
uh, and uh, you, you know, you can visit a James Garfield library in his hometown, but it's privately run. And uh, other presidents simply donated uh, their materials to places that, um, uh, you know, uh, libraries in their hometowns or a big library in their state, things like that. Uh, you can look all of these up and where they're at. They're great fun to go to. Uh, I've done research at many of them. Uh, they are <clears throat> uh, 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 places where when I'd show my University of Minnesota card, uh, they'd say, oh, we're going to have the director come out and talk to you and say, you want to go back? And I said, sure. And uh, one really memorable event was... Uh, in Independence, Missouri, the Harry Truman Library, and the guy said, uh, <clears throat> come on, I'll take you back. <clears throat> and he showed me around back there, and they had a huge uh, vault area where everything was still top secret, was kept in there from the Truman administration. And uh, when I was at the Eisenhower Library, they took me back. They at the Eisenhower Library, they went like five stories underground storing stuff. I told the guy, I said, when I was a kid, my my uh, uh, father, my parents bought me a wood burning set. And one of the panels that came with it was a portrait of Eisenhower. So I wood burned it. And I said, then as an adult, I wrote to Mamie Eisenhower and I said, I had this wood burning of your husband, and I sent her a picture of it, and she wrote back to me a handwritten letter and said, as a young woman, me and my sisters had wood-burning sets, and we made jewelry boxes. We'd wood-burn wood and then put them together as a jewelry box. I told that to the curator, so after he's walking me all around, he goes over to this big case and opens a drawer, and there's a whole bunch of these jewelry cases that had been made by Mamie Eisenhower in there. Um, anyway, uh, now I should talk about. Is yeah, that it? Let's or, take about two minutes for you to just kind of plug the James Madison series coming. Oh, up. yeah. Well, uh, James Madison will be up next. Uh, starts in seven weeks. So we have a lengthy layoff. It will last just one quarter. Uh, uh, James Madison uh, was president 1809 to 1817. The War of 1812 is a big event in his presidency. Uh, also of great significance is his wife, Dolly Madison, probably the most famous uh, first lady of all time. <clears throat> we'll talk about her a little bit uh, this is a class on presidents. There have been people doing first lady classes at the university, so I uh, limit what I say about that. Um, and uh, and then we'll have uh, a very lengthy summer break. Uh, spring quarter will be the only quarter that I do James Madison. He won't take two quarters. Um, Right. And, uh, you know, interesting guy, founding father, you know, still these guys that we've been taught, that we've talked about so far, <clears throat> were all born British citizens. Martin Van Buren was the first president born in the United States. So we'll talk about that, too, and, you know, what sorts of loyalties they had to the British Empire. So good. Thank you. Thank you Thank all. You. And uh, uh, one final thing, uh, you can sign up through Wally for the class. I am assuming that the library is going to continue to do my class. They have not told me they will not. So I, you can also sign up through the library. Thank you.